Hey guys, welcome back to Pro Tools 101. Last week, we spoke about a new window called a dashboard window, which is basically the first window that you will encounter whenever you launch Pro Tools. The dashboard window is the place from where you can create a new session or a project, where you can open a session or a project that you have previously created, and you can set up the parameters for the session that you are creating. Parameters like the file type that you should record your audio in. Just to recall, Pro Tools can record audio in only two file formats. That is the WAV and the AIFF. Pro Tools cannot record audio in any other format. Please remember that. You can import audio from another format like an MP3 file or an MPEG4 file. You can export audio to MP3 or MPEG4 but you cannot record in any other format except for WAVE and AIFF. Technically, there is no difference between the two, so you should not really, it should not really matter whether you choose AIFF or WAVE. A lot of people prefer to go with WAVE because they feel in, I mean, there used to be a time, it's, it's not a wrong feeling, there used to be a time when WAVE was more compatible than AIFF because AIFF is actually a format that was championed by Apple back in the day. Today, it's pretty much native to any operating system, whether you're using Windows, whether you're using Linux, or whether you're using the Mac OS. All operating systems will be able to play back WAV and AIFF files without any additional software need. So it should not matter. I prefer to use AIFF because I can store much more tag information with the file. A broadcast WAV file will be able to store the name of the file, the name of the artist, the, maybe the name of the album, but that's it. In an AIFF file, you can store much more information, like the year of the composition, the composer of the track, the arranger of the track, the mixing engineer's name. You can store album art. There's a lot of data that you can store with AIFF, right? But in terms of the audio quality itself, there's absolutely no difference between a WAV and an AIFF file. The dashboard is also where you can specify the sample rate and the bit depth that your session should be using if you're creating a new session or a new project. The maximum sample rate that Pro Tools can go up to is 192 kilohertz or 192,000 hertz. Please don't forget that. That is important. Once we created a session last time, we also saw how we can create tracks. Pro Tools gives you the option of many different kinds of tracks. We have audio tracks, MIDI tracks, aux tracks, uh, instrument tracks, VCA master tracks, and master fader tracks, and two kinds of folder tracks as well, the basic and the routing folder tracks. The most important thing in this, uh, from that is to remember that when you, whenever you create an audio track, or whenever you create any track in order to do any kind of recording, try and remember to rename the track before you start your recording so that all the recordings that you make take the name of the track itself. We will see in today's lecture how that actually works. I'm going to do a recording on a new track and I'll show you how the clips that get created take the name of the track itself. But the most important thing to remember about tracks is if you delete a track in Pro Tools, you cannot undo that action. So always be extra, extra sure that you know exactly what you're trying to delete and when you're going to delete it because that is not something that you can revert. That's not something that you can go back and say, oops, I made a mistake, all right? So that was last week. Today, we're going to look at how we can set up our Pro Tools hardware and software for recording audio. We're going to create and configure the click track, uh, which is something that I mentioned to you before. We're going to do a little bit of recording onto our track in, in our session or the project, whatever you choose. Uh, we're going to see how we can reorganize uh, or how we, and how we can recognize whole clips or whole file clips and subset clips. We're going to define what they are and how you can actually identify what you have and how many you have. And lastly, we're also going to organize uh, our clips and audio files after recording. We can see how we can rename our audio files, how we can delete our audio files, how we can reduce unwanted files in our Pro Tools session so that we have only what we need and everything that we don't need is no longer there. All right, so let's start. This is my dashboard window. Now, before I actually create a session for today's class, I want to see what kind of hardware my Pro Tools system is going to use. 
most of you will not have an external interface, which is completely fine. Uh, and most of you, uh, I mean, there will be a few of you that do have an external interface and would like to use that as well with your Pro Tools session. So uh, what, what I'm going to say now is actually not uh, not part of the Pro Tools 101. It's not in the book as well. But I want to show it to you because, you know, there, there will be people in both case situations. So I don't want you to be stuck in a situation where you're not sure what exactly is happening in your system. So I'm going to show you how you can actually use Pro Tools with an external interface and how you can use Pro Tools without an external interface, All right? So when you launch Pro Tools and you see the dashboard window, let's go ahead and hit cancel for now, right? Because I don't want to create a new session yet. Before I create my new session, I want to identify or I want to see what kind of hardware I have connected to my system. Now, if you're on a Mac uh, or on a PC, it works very similarly. The only difference is on a PC, the software that you need does not come with the PC. But on a Mac, the software that you need to see all the hardware, your audio hardware connected to your Mac, Mac it comes with your Mac operating system, right? But for Pro Tools to actually be able to identify which hardware you want to use, we go up to the setup menu and we select the playback engine. Over here, under the playback engine drop-down menu, Pro Tools will show you all the different hardware that is currently connected to the system or has been used with the system at any point uh, of time, right? Like over here, you can see I have many different kinds of hardware that I can choose. I have a universal audio Thunderbolt interface uh, through which my voice is currently being recorded. I have an SSL2, which I brought and connected via USB just to use as an example for today's class. Uh, or I can use my Pro Tools Aggregate I.O., which is basically my built-in sound card and my built-in microphone. The thing to understand about your built-in speakers and your microphone is that the operating system will actually look at it as two different devices. That means your microphone is going to be considered as one interface and your speakers will get considered as a separate interface. It does not get identified as one. Like if you connect an external interface, on the external interface, the input and the output channels are still clubbed as one device. They show up as one device, right? Your operating system will look at the external, the USB interface or the Thunderbolt interface that you connect as one interface. But when it comes to the built-in interfaces, when it comes to the built-in devices that you have, your speakers and your microphone are not considered as one interface. They're considered as two different interfaces. On the Mac, whenever Pro Tools gets installed, what Pro Tools does is it creates a virtual interface. And this virtual interface is called the aggregate I.O. The Mac operating system allows you to combine multiple interfaces and use them as one interface, which is basically what we want. If I do not have an external interface and I want to use Pro Tools, I want Pro Tools to use my built-in microphone and my built-in speakers as one interface. My built-in microphone should be the input. My built-in speakers should be the output. So when Pro Tools actually boots up, when I create my new session, I want Pro Tools to understand that this microphone and this output is actually one interface. Don't look at it as two different interfaces, but see it as one so that I can use both at the same time. Pro Tools cannot use multiple interfaces at one time unless they are combined or unless they are identified or defined in the operating system as one interface. Now on the Mac, as I said, we have an application called the Audio MIDI uh, Setup, which is going to be in your Applications folder. And when you go to your Audio MIDI Setup over here, you will see the Pro Tools Aggregate I.O., which is something that got created when I installed Pro Tools. When you select the Pro Tools Aggregate I.O., on the right side, you will see all the different hardware that you have. And here you will see that my MacBook Pro microphone and my MacBook Pro speakers the ones that are selected, are the only ones that are identified as the devices to be used with this interface or with this aggregate I.O. So when I tell Pro Tools that my sound card or my playback engine should be the Pro Tools aggregate I.O., Pro Tools knows that it's supposed to use my MacBook Pro microphone and my MacBook Pro speakers as the input and the output respectively. Right? 
let's take a look at the SSL2, which I have connected over here. Now over here, you can see that the SSL2 is a two-channel input and a two-channel output interface. I can't choose anything inside that. I can't deselect a particular input or a particular output. I can only see what the inputs are and what the outputs are. That be that's because it's an external device. That's because it's something that is predefined. It's not something that I can change. If I wanted to use my SSL along with my MacBook Pro interface as one interface, I can actually come down to my aggregate I.O. and I can select the SSL to tell Pro Tools that the SSL is also an interface that I want to use. So if I do that, Pro Tools will not only see the MacBook Pro microphone as an input, but it will also see the two input channels from the SSL as an available input which means the total number of inputs that I can do in Pro Tools will be three. And the total number of outputs that I can do from Pro Tools will be four. Two from my MacBook Pro microphone and two from my SSL2 interface. Right? For now, let's not do that. Let's just go with the standard input output that is going to be the built-in input output. That's my MacBook Pro microphone as the input and my MacBook Pro speakers as the output. Right? So I'm not going to change anything over here, but this is where you can change. And this, the audio MIDI setup is a software that comes with every Mac OS. It's pre-installed. You don't have to install it. On Windows, though, there is no audio MIDI setup. For Windows, we need a special software called the ASIO drivers. And I know many of you already reached out to me about it and have installed it on your Windows system. The ASIO for all software basically does the exact same thing. The ASIO for all software will take a look at all the inputs and outputs that you have, and it will allow you to redefine or recreate a combined input output so that when, when you launch Pro Tools in your playback engine, when you drop down the menu, you will see an option there called ASIO or ASIO version 2 or version 3 or whatever version you've actually downloaded for your operating system. So when you select ASIO, instead of Pro Tools Aggregate I.O., you will see ASIO. And when you choose that, all the hardware that you have enabled under the ASIO in the ASIO app will be available to Pro Tools. So the number of inputs, the number of outputs that you have enabled in the ASIO configuration software will is what Pro Tools will actually use. So you will not see Pro Tools Aggregate I.O., you will see ASIO. If you're using an external interface in Windows, you can select the external interface directly, right? You don't have to use the ASIO drivers because usually external interfaces will have their own drivers and Windows will either install them automatically for you or that they will come with a disk that you need to install the drivers for. But once that is installed, you don't need the ASIO drivers. You will need the ASIO drivers if you want to use your external interface and you want to use your built-in speakers. Then it works, you know, you need to combine them for which you will need the ASIO drivers. But otherwise, you don't need them, right? So for this first example, let's actually do the SSL, all right? I'm going to select the SSL. So now when I say OK and when I go back to my dashboard to create a new session, Pro Tools is going to create a new session using the SSL as my input and my output, right? So I'm going to say OK over here. I have the SSL. Uh, let me just show it to you. This is what the SSL2 looks like. Uh, I have it connected via USB to my Mac, and I have a microphone, a handy, nifty, reliable SM58 connected to input one of the SSL. So I'm going to use this to actually record signals into the computer uh, or into Pro Tools, and uh, we'll see how it goes, right? So I have selected SSL2 as my playback engine. I am back in my dashboard. I'm going to create a new session. I'm going to call this Pro Tools 101, Chapter 5. Let's just go with Pro Tools 101. I'm going to choose my file type to be AIFF. I'm going to choose my bit depth to be 24-bit. Let my sample rate be 48K. All that is good. Now, in my I.O. settings, I want Pro Tools to ensure that it detects all the input outputs that are there. If I go with last used, my last used did not have the same number of inputs and my outputs as my SSL. My SSL has two in and two out but my last used was my Pro Tools aggregate I.O., which was only one in and two out. 
So I want Pro Tools to actually relook at my hardware and reconfigure my input and my output channels so that everything that can be used is available to me when I create my session or when I begin my recording, right? So I'm going to drop down my IO settings and I'm going to tell Pro Tools use stereo mix because I'm working in stereo, right? Um, another thing, if you recall, last time I told you we can change our sample rate up to 192 kilohertz based on the hardware that we have. So if I drop down my sample rate menu over here today, now we will see that I can go all the way up to 192K because the SSL2 supports 192K. My built-in microphone and my built-in sound card, my Pro Tools aggregate I.O., would go only up to 96K because that's the sample rate, that's the maximum resolution that my MacBook can actually do. The SSL can go much higher. So if you do have the recording space and you can afford uh, to record at a higher sample rate, by all means do so, right? But otherwise 48K is the minimum that you should be recording at. So for today, let's just stick with 48K. I am going to save my uh, session at the default location, which is inside my hard disk called the Data HD, inside a folder called Pro Tools Sessions. And I'm going to say Create. And Pro Tools has created a new session for me. All right. So let's just expand this. Now, let's take a look at my input-output setup over here, right? So if I come to my Setup menu, I go to my I.O., which is the full form for, uh, which stands for Input-Output. Over here, I will see that Pro Tools has two inputs and it has two outputs. It has detected my SSL and it is giving me the two inputs and the two outputs that I want, right? So that is good. So now if I create a, an audio track, I'm going to do, use a shortcut command shift N to bring up the new tracks window. I'm going to create two mono audio tracks because I have one microphone connected only to one channel, but... I have two channels available. I want to show you what the input output looks like. So I'm going to create two mono audio tracks and I'm going to say create. And my tracks have been created. They are called audio one and audio two. Let's go to the mix window. I'm going to use a shortcut command equal. And over here, I can see my input has been set to input one and input two respectively for both the channels of audio, right? If I select the input button over here, I can choose to change my in input by selecting the interface itself. Now, if I had added my SSL2 to my Pro Tools aggregate, I would have had a third choice. It would have shown me my MacBook Pro. It would have shown me the SSL input 1 and the SSL input 2. As of now, I can see only the SSLs input 1 and 2 because I am choosing to use only the SSL for as my playback engine, as my main interface within Pro Tools. Similarly, in my output over here, when I click on it, since the SSL has only two outputs, it is showing me only the two outputs that are available to me, right? So when I do a recording now over here, I'm going to mute this ch uh, channel and then do a recording because otherwise it's going to cause a feedback loop uh, since my speakers are uh, the MacBook Pro speakers, or, sorry, my speakers are the studio speakers and the input and the output of the SSL is going through the system. It's going to cause a feedback loop, right? So I'm going to mute this and then hit record. And I should be seeing level come into my track over here in Pro Tools. There we go, right? So as I speak into the SM58 microphone over here, I can see that my sound is going into Pro Tools because my microphone is connected to input one of my SSL. Do you get it? Cool. Let's take another example now. I'm going to turn this off record come back to my edit window and I'm going to close the session and I'm going to reopen the session, but I'm going to change my interface before I uh, reopen the session, right? So I'm going to save and let's close session. There we go. And I'm going to go back to my playback engine and I'm going to change my interface from the SSL2. I don't want to use the external interface. I want to use my built-in sound card. So I'm going to choose the Pro Tools Aggregate I.O. If you're on Windows, you should be choosing the ASIO driver uh, unless you have an external interface, right? So when I choose ex uh, a a Pro Tools Aggregate I.O. and I say OK, now Pro Tools is ready to use my built-in sound card 
as uh, my built-in microphone and my built-in speakers as the main interface, right? So if I bring back my dashboard, I go to Recents and I say Pro Tools 101 and open, Pro Tools will pop up a warning for me. It's telling me that, okay, my input and my outputs do not look the same as it was when I saved the session, right? It's just giving me a warning, which means it's something that I need to check before I proceed to do anything else, right? Do I want to save this as a detailed report? Nah, I know what it is, right? So I don't need to save it as a detailed report. So I have my session over here now. Let's take a look at my I.O. setup now. So I'm going up to my setup window. I go to my input output section. My output is fine. I can see my MacBook Pro speakers. The number of outputs did not change. My, I had two outputs on my SSL. I have two outputs on my MacBook Pro. So I'm good. But let's take a look at the inputs now. My MacBook Pro microphone is just one input. My SSL was two inputs, right? Which is why now I can see that I have only one input available to me in Pro Tools. So when I say OK, let's take a look at my mix window where I can actually define the input for every track. I'm going to use the shortcut again, Command Equal. And when I come back over here, I can see that the input is grayed out. That's because Pro Tools cannot find the input that it was using before. So when I select the input option over here, I can go back to the interface and choose MacBook Pro microphone, right? So now when I hit record, again, I'm going to mute so that it does not cause any feedback loop. And I hit record. I will be able to see that my sound is getting into my MacBook Pro microphone. I'm not holding the SM58, right? So this is how you can actually choose your different hardwares. And this is how you can set up your hardware for your recording in Pro Tools. Depending on the hardware that you have connected, make sure you choose the right kind of hardware from the playback engine window in the setup menu, right? Everything that I showed you here is not actually part of the 101, but since each of us is at a different place, each of us has a different hardware configuration, I wanted you to be aware of what Pro Tools will be looking for if you decide to use your built-in interface or if you decide to use an external interface when you decide to do a recording, all right? So I'm gonna go back to the edit window over here and I'm going to delete these two tracks for now. I'll come back to that a little later. All righty. So I have my session now. What's the first thing I want to do? If I'm a music composer and I want to produce my own music, I want to record some uh, music, the first thing I need is a timing reference, which means I need a I need a metronome, I need a click. If you recall, as I told you in our previous lectures, the metronome button over here turns your click on and off, but only if you have the click installed or click activated within Pro Tools. Pro Tools, unlike the other DAWs, you cannot just turn, you cannot just enable or disable your click, uh, the, the sound of the click without well, it's not, it's not just a button. Let me just put it like that. That's because Pro Tools allows you to configure the sound itself, which means if I wanted to use a different sound for my click, I could do that. I could change that. No other DAW actually allows you to do that, which is why the click in Pro Tools is actually a track. So if I come up to my track menu over here, the last option that you see over here is called Create Click Track. Right? I don't need to go to the new tracks dialog box. I just come to the tracks menu and I do create click track and Pro Tools creates a click track for me. Now listen what happens when I press my play button. I hear the click, right? Now if I turn the metronome off over here and press play again, I do not hear the click track. Right? That's because my metronome controls the click track. So the metronome only controls the sound of the click. That means whether you want it on or whether you want it off. But the sound of the click needs to be activated using a click track. What is a click track? A click track is technically an aux track. But if you look at it in the mix window, you will see that it's an aux track with a plugin that is inserted. The plugin that is inserted is called the Click plugin. And when you click it, Pro Tools brings up this plugin window, which allows you to configure the sound of the click itself. 
You have sliders that allow you to change the volume of the accented and the regular click. We have options to change the sound that we want for the accented click, or that means the start of every bar and the remaining beats. Or we have we have options of changing the the the, the meter of the click itself, right? It can be different than what our session meter is, or it can be at a different tempo. It is completely configurable. You can even change the sound that you have, right? So let's turn the click back on so that we can hear what all choices we have, right? So I'm going to press play. Now this is the standard click sound. If I wanted to change that, let's say I wanted to change the accented sound, right? I'm going to click over here. I have the choice of choosing different kinds of bells, blocks, classic sounds, miscellaneous sounds, other sounds, shaker sounds. So let's say I wanted a shaker 2 accented. And for the regular uh, the beats, I'm going to go with a shaker 3, right? So now when I press play, I get a different kind of sound. I can even change the volume of the click. So if I wanted the accented sound to be really loud, but the regular uh, beat sounds to be really soft, I could do that as well. Right? So you have complete control over the sound of the click when you create your click track like this using the click plugin. You can even change when you want to hear the click. So if I double click on the metronome over here, it'll bring up my click and count off options. Here, I can choose when I want to hear the click. Do I want to hear the click only during play and record? That means all the time. Or do I want to hear it only during a recording? So when I just press play, I will not hear the click sound. I will hear it only when I press record. Or do I want to hear it only for the count off? Which means when I, tell, when I turn on my count off of two bars, Pro Tools will count down for two bars and then start recording or then start playing. So do I want to hear the click only at that time or do you want to hear it all the time? By default, it will uh, the click sound will happen during your playback and your recording, right? So you can change the option that you have over here. The accented and the unaccented MIDI notes that you see over here or the keys that you see over here, the C3 and the velocity and the duration, these apply only when you're using a virtual instrument as a click sound, which means if you have a virtual instrument with a guitar sound, a nylon string guitar that you want to use for your click, you can do that as well, right? So when you're using a virtual instrument, you can choose which key of that virtual instrument is going to be the accented, that means the start of the bar, and the unaccented, which is the beats uh, for your click sound. But you don't need to change that for now, right? You can also choose how many bars of count off you want in the click count off options. This click count off options window can be opened in two ways. Like I did just now, you can either double click on the metronome itself to open it up, or you can come up to the setup menu and then select click and count off. That's the second last option that we have over here. And it will pop up the exact same window for you, right? So two ways in which you can actually change your click and count off options. Quick logical uh, question. If my click sound is just a plugin, can I have more than one click track in Pro Tools? The answer to that question is actually yes, you can. So if I come up to Pro Tools, I can actually go back to track and tell Pro Tools, create another click track for me. So if I wanted to hear two different clicks at two different times, I could actually do that. Or if you have a crazy drummer and a crazy guitarist and the drummer wants a click of a different kind and the guitarist wants a click of a different kind, you could do that. You could customize a different click sound for different people in your band and make them hear individually, depending on the number of outputs that you have, obviously, uh, so that they're not hearing the same thing. right? So you have the option of creating multiple click tracks. You don't need to have, uh, you don't need to go to track and say create click track every time you want to create a click track. If you have an extra aux track, right, like this, if I have an aux track, I could just come up to the insert section, I could come to the plugin section, I could go to the instruments and I can tell Pro Tools to insert the click track for me directly, right? So I don't have to go to the track and say create click track. I could do the same by just creating an aux track and then inserting the click plugin on that track itself, right? 
So there is no limit on, uh, you know, it's it's not like you can have only one click. This is, again, something that no other DAW allows, right? You can't have multiple clicks in, in, uh, in any other DAW. You can, in fact, you know, have different clicks at different times. So if you want the first click, it can be at the session BPM, which is 120 BPM, and you could tell it to follow the meter, right? Or, or, or in your, and in your second click, you could tell it to not follow the meter, right? You could change the meter to like a waltz if you wanted, but have the same tempo. In your third click, you could have it at a different tempo altogether, or you could just turn off the unaccented so that it's just giving you the start of the bars, not the sounds of the beats itself right so you can customize the click to anything that you want for multiple people at the same time right so that's what the click plugin is now let's create an audio track uh, to do a recording for me i'm just going to keep one of these click tracks i'm going to select two of my uh, aux tracks that i have over here right click and say delete i have my standard click track over here which is giving me the shaker sound And let's say I want to use that, right? I'm going to come back to my edit window. I'm going to close the click plugin. And I'm going to create a new audio track because I want to try doing a recording for you now. So I'm going to do Command Shift N again to bring up the new tracks dialog box. I'm going to select mono because I have only one microphone connected, which is my built-in microphone. I'm going to just leave it as audio for now. And I'm going to say create. So now I'm going to again mute and hit record so that you can actually, uh, uh, let me actually show you what happens if I don't uh, mute the track over here, right? I'm going to bring up the volume of my speakers slowly. So as I increase the volume, you will slowly start hearing a feedback loop for me. That is what I want to avoid. That's the reason I'm actually hitting mute so that I can record without having to hear the sound that I'm recording so that it does not go back into the microphone and cause a feedback loop, right? If you're using headphones, obviously you're not going to get that because the microphone sound is not going to go into your headphones. So if you're using headphones, you're going to be fine. But over here in, in this room, I don't, I, I don't want to use headphones. I have the speakers. So I'm going to mute my uh, channel and then do a recording. So a couple of ways in which you need to do rec uh, to in in which you can do the recording there are some shortcuts that you can use to do the recording as well but whenever you want to record on a particular track you need to make sure that you record um that track or record enable that particular track so if i have like 10 audio tracks or if i have five more audio tracks over here only the tracks on which i do record enable are going to be able to record any audio on that particular track Right? So if I don't record enable, the track is not going to do any kind of recording if I press the record button on, the, on my transport window. Right? Let's get rid of these extra tracks for now. So I want to do a recording over here. I have record on my track. I need to record on my transport. And when I hit play, Pro Tools will start recording from where my playback cursor and my edit cursor is. My edit and my playback cursor are linked, if you remember from last time. And they're both right at the beginning of my session. You can see my main counter is showing me the start as 11000, which means it's at the first bar. So all I need to do is press the play button on my transport and Pro Tools will start recording like this. This is a test recording. Testing. One, two, three, five, four, six. Stop. Right? There are other ways to do recordings as well. So instead of using your mouse to actually uh, press record and press play, you could just use your keyboard shortcuts. If you're using a Mac or PC, you could just press the F12 key and Pro Tools will start recording, right? So this is what happened when I press the F12 key. On a Mac, by default, the function keys, your F1, F2, F3, are actually set for different Mac operating system controls, like your brightness and your volume control and your play and pause and all that. You can change that by going to the system preferences and under the keyboards, there is an option where you can tell your Mac OS to use the function keys as function keys, which is what you want when you're actually using Pro Tools because F1, 2, 3, 4 are your four edit uh, modes. F5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 are your edit tools. So you want to be able to actually use your function keys as function keys. So make sure you enable that. If you're using a full-size keyboard, uh, whether, you, you, whether you are on a Mac or PC, if you're using a full-size keyboard 
with the number pad as well, even the number three is actually going to be doing the same thing. So if I press the number key, three key on my numeric keypad, Pro Tools is going to start recording as well, right? So there are three ways in which you can actually do your, and there's actually another way, there's a fourth way, sorry, my bad. Um, the first way is to, uh, is to press record on my transport and then press play, right? The second is to press the F12 key. The third is to press the number three key on a full-size numeric keypad. That means you can't do that on your laptop. And the fourth way is to use, I think it's command, yeah, command and space bar at the same time. So you press command and then you press the space bar. Or if you're using Windows, it's control and the space bar and Pro Tools will start recording for you, right? Now let's take a look at all these audio files that got created in the system. Right? I'm gonna just zoom in over here. I can see that Pro Tools has created four audio files for me, right? It has created audio 101, audio 1 underscore 02, audio 1 underscore 03, and audio 1 underscore 04, right? I can see the audio files that, that have been created in my clips list as well. Are we here? There we go. Let's actually expand that a little bit more. I can see the audio files that have been created, audio 1 underscore 01, audio 1 underscore 02, 103, and 104. Four audio files that got created when I did my recording. But if I look at the recording itself, I can see that the quality of the recording does not seem good enough. It's not loud enough, right? The size of the waveform vertically actually shows me the quality of the recording that I'm getting. So if I did want my recording to be really, really good, I have to make sure that my input signal is somewhere over here, right? In the light green range, in between um, around, the, uh, around the minus 10 dB mark that you see over here. Let me record on this track again. And I see that my input signal is now hovering somewhere around the minus 25 mark, which is not that good. You want your signal to be much, much better. You want your signal to be nearly near the minus 10 mark. See, I can't get near the minus 10 mark because the microphone is a little far away from me, right? If I was using a handheld microphone, yeah, I could bring it really close to myself. The problem is... I can't change the fader volume over here. So if I bring the fader up or down, that does not change the quality of the signal that is going in to my computer. The only way to change the sound or the change the level of the signal that's going in is to adjust it in my interface. Now on my built-in interface, I don't have a mic pre, I don't have a preamp that allows me to you know, control the input signal that's going into my computer, into my Mac which means the only way I can actually increase the sound of, the Mac, of, this, um, of my microphone on my MacBook Pro is by going closer to the microphone itself, which is, 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 not, is not something that you can do all the time, which is why we have interfaces and external mic pre's. Now, if I was using the SSL, if I was using the SSL, I have a mic pre control over here, right? You can see if I talk into the SSL, you can see the lights go up, right? So if I do use the SSL, I can control the input level signal by moving this gain knob that I have over here, right? I can't do this on my MacBook Pro. You can't do this on a PC if you're using the built-in interface or the built-in microphone of your PC either, right? Which is why an external interface is good if you're trying to do a recording. You can do these controls. You can control the level of the signal that's going in. Always remember this fader that we have in, my, in the mix window, this fader only controls the output of the signal. That means once the signal goes inside Pro Tools, once it's recorded onto my hard drive, when Pro Tools plays back the sound that is being recorded, the fader controls the volume of that sound, the sound that's coming out from Pro Tools, not the sound that is going in. So whenever you're doing any kind of recording, always check two things. Well, check one thing, but remember another thing. The thing you need to check is to make sure that your signal is always above the minus 10 mark, right? It should be around, technically in between the minus 10 and the minus 5 mark. That is the signal that you really, really want. Keep a little bit of headroom. Don't push it all the way above minus 5 because then if suddenly there is a loud moment in your song, it's going to clip it's going to distort, it's going to get chopped off, right? You don't want that to happen. So you want to be a little way down, but not too down as well. What, I mean, why can't I just increase the fader after I finish my recording? 
because if I after I finish my recording, if I record now where my signal is around the minus 25 mark, and after I finish my recording and boost up my signal, I'll boost up the volume of my sound, it's not only going to boost up the sound that I have recorded, but it's also going to boost up the noise that I recorded at that time, which is why a microphone preamplifier is important. The microphone preamplifier does not amplify the noise. It amplifies the signal without the noise. Right, so you—that's what the mic, the the interface gain knob does. It allows you to boost up the microphone signal, not the noise. Right, so make sure you choose the right kind of setting. Make sure when you do any kind of recording. Now you, you're learning recording and mixing as well. So when you do your recording in the studio or when you do your recording at home using your own interface, your own microphone, make sure you aim for the level of the signal that's going into Pro Tools to be above the minus ten on the fader mark. Always remember the pan and the fader is only controlling the output, right? Not the input. Let's go back to the audio clips that we have here, right? I'm going to take this off record because I don't want to record anything by mistake. Uh, that, that's another thing that you should be doing. Once you finish your recording and you're sure everything is done, it's okay, it's good, take it off record, right? Make sure you don't keep it record armed because by mistake, if you press the F12 key or you press the number three key on your numeric keypad, you may end up recording something somewhere that you may not realize, all right? Things to notice over here. When I did my recording on this particular track, you will see that the clips that got created, I created four audio recordings over here. Every recording creates a WAV file. Right, which means if I go to my session, which is in my data HD, Pro Tools sessions, Pro Tools 101, audio files. If I look at my audio files folder over here, I will see that Pro Tools has created four audio files for me. Audio 101, Audio 102, Audio 103, and Audio 104.aiff, because that's the file format that I have chosen, right? So I have four recordings, and each of these recordings is a file on my system. Let's cut this up, all right? Oh, before I do that, let's, uh, let me highlight one more thing. If I take a look at the name of these four audio clips, they have taken the name of the track, which means every recording that I have is called audio one underscore the number of the recording or the, the, which recording I have actually done. So this was my first recording, so it's got under, uh, underscore 01. This was my second recording, so it's called audio one underscore 02. This was my third, hence underscore 03. This was my fourth, so hence underscore 04. So four recordings, four files in my audio files folder, and each of them have the same name that is taken from the name of the track. If my track was called something else, if my track was called vocals, and now I do a recording over here. Let's record arm. And testing, one, two, three, four, five. Now my audio clip that got created has the name of the track underscore 01. So the name of the track was vocals, so it's called vocals underscore 01. If I take a look at my audio files folder, I have vocals underscore 01 dot AIFF as well. Right? So make sure you rename your tracks. Now, if I was recording a band or if even if I was just recording a drummer, usually you're going to use at least eight to 10 mics on a drum, a, a drum kit when you do your recording. So if you have like 10 different audio tracks and everything's called audio one, audio two, audio three, audio four, audio five, you won't know which one is the kick, which one is a snare, which one is a tom, one, two, three, which one's your overhats, which one's your snare, uh, cymbals. It's going to be a right mess, right? So you want to make sure that you rename all your tracks before you start your recording at any point. Let's cut up my audio one underscore or one. Let's just zoom in so that we can see this a little bit better over here. I'm gonna take this off record so that I don't make a mistake again. So I'm gonna cut up this file. I think these are the numbers that I, uh, that I said. Let me just play these back. One, two, three, five, four. There we go. So I made a mistake over here on purpose. I said one, two, three, five, four, and six instead of four, five, and six, right? Let's turn off the click for now. I don't want to hear the click anymore. So I'm going to turn off the metronome. And so this is number one, number two, number three, number five, number four, and number six, all right? I'm going to cut up number five. So I'm going to use my selector tool 
and select what I think is number five. Let's just confirm. Five. Yeah. Five. So that is number five. I am going to cut up number five. I'm just going to press the letter B on my keyboard, right? And it's going to chop up my audio. So this is number five. This is number four. So I'm going to bring my edit cursor over here again. And I'm going to press the letter B as well. All right. Now let's take a look at the file names or the clip names that you see over here. I'm just going to zoom in a little bit more. You can see that my audio one underscore oh one now has a hyphen and a number next to it. So this is hyphen oh one. This is hyphen oh two. This is hyphen oh four. And this is hyphen oh five. Hyphen oh three was a combination of four and five until I cut it up again, right? So hyphen oh one, hyphen oh two, hyphen oh four, hyphen oh five, right? Can you tell me what these are? Are these going to be independent files? If I look in my audio files folder now, am I going to have audio underscore audio one underscore oh one dash oh one, audio one underscore oh one dash oh two, oh four and oh five? Are these independent WAV files? They are not. If you take a look at the audio files folder, you will see that the audio one underscore or one file has not been cut up, right? Which means all the edits that you do in Pro Tools are non-destructive, right? What I have created now in Pro Tools are called subset clips. What I recorded in Pro Tools, that means these files that I created over here, those are called whole file clips or whole file audio files. Right, So whenever you do a recording and Pro Tools creates a WAV file of that recording, it creates in Pro Tools, in your session itself, it creates what we reference as a whole file. When you chop up the whole file into smaller parts like what I did over here, it is called a subset clip. A clip is basically metadata. It's information or basically start point and end point information about an audio file or about a file. Uh, it can be an audio file, it can be a MIDI file, it can be a video file, it can be any file, right? So a clip is nothing but virtual information. It's information, it's just a set of start and end points, right? So I have one subset clip over here, I have another subset clip over here, I have another subset clip over here. Where are these subset clips stored? The subset clips, since it's just information, the subset clip information is stored in my Pro Tools session itself. It is not stored as audio files outside. Audio files get created only and only when you do a recording in Pro Tools. Otherwise, they do not get created as an, as a, as an actual file on your hard disk. A subset clip is not an actual file. A subset clip is a part of an actual file. It's something that is part of a whole file. How do I know which one is a subset clip and how do I know which one is a whole file? Well, two ways to know it. One, you can see the name, right? So when you see the name and you see a hyphen and a number, that basically the number tells you how many th part or how many th subset it is of the whole file clip. So I have a whole file, audio one underscore o one, of which this is the fifth subset clip. This is the fourth subset clip. This is the second subset clip. And this is the first subset clip, right? So the number that you see right at the end is what tells you the number of the subset clips there are. That's the first way to find out. The second way to find out is if you look in your audio, in, in your clips list. Now, if you look at the clips list over here, you could see audio one underscore O one. And then you will see audio one underscore oh one dash oh one oh two oh four and oh five, right? You will if you look really carefully over here, you will see that some of these files are in bold, and some of these files are not in bold. So the way to actually say how many subset clips you have or how many whole file clips you have is to just see which of these are bold and which of these are not bold. All the files or all the clips in your clips list which are bold are your whole file clips or your whole file audio files, which means each and every one of these clips which is in bold has an actual file in your audio files folders, is a WAV file or an AIFF file in your audio files folders. Any of these clips that are not bold are not going to be WAV or AIFF files in your audio files folders because they are 
subset clips. That means audio one underscore O one dash O one all the way till O five. All of these are your subset clips. That means they are only information, start and end point informations about parts of an whole file, parts of an audio clip or audio file that is in your hard disk itself, right? Is that clear? It can get a little confusing, uh, but it's, it is pretty straightforward, right? There are two types of clips that we can have, the whole file audio clips and the subset clips. Now, there's another thing that you need to be aware of in your clips list as well, and that is if you have a multi-channel clip, right? Let's say I am doing a recording of my drum track and I record a stereo audio track for my overheads. I'm going to call this overheads. I have a stereo recording over here. And let's assume I'm just going to select a couple of uh, bars and beats over here and I'm just going to create a dummy file, right? I have a file over here called overheads underscore O one. If I look in my audio files folder now, I see that I have overheads underscore O one dot AIFF as well. Even though it's a multi-channel file, it creates one file because when I created my Pro Tools session, I had made sure that the interleaved button was on or the interleaved check mark was actually enabled, right? Which is why even though it's two channels of audio, it has actually created one wave file for me, right? Now let's chop this up. Let's say I cut my overheads file over here and over here. So I have audio under, uh, overheads uh, underscore 01 dash 01 dash 03 and dash 04, right? I have three subset clips. I know I have three subset clips, but I do not have three files in my audio files folder. I have only one file in my audio files folder. If I look at my clips list over here, now I can see that it shows me my multi-channel audio clip as well. How do I know that the whole file is multi-channel or how do I know whether a clip is multi-channel? Well, there are two ways to know if it's multi-channel. One, it'll obviously tell you uh, the number of channels that are there in brackets next to the name of the file. Like I see the word stereo written in brackets next to overheads underscore O1. But I also see a small triangle un just before the name overheads underscore O1. That also signifies to me that it is a multi-channel file. That's a multi-channel whole or whole file, right? So if I actually click on that triangle, I can drop it down to see the individual channels itself. Now, since this is a stereo of a file, I only have two channels, left and right. But if I was working in 5.1, I would actually have six channels of audio, left, center, right, left surround, right surround, and subwoofer, right? So clicking on this triangle will show you the individual channels of audio that you have inside the whole file or inside the multi-channel clip in your clips list. This is actually one of the common questions in the exams as well. They will you know, show you a photo like this and ask you, how many whole audio files do you see? Or how many whole audio multi-channel files do you see? Or how many subset multi-channel clips do you see in the clips list or in this session? Always remember if the name of the clip, if the name of the file is in bold, that means it is a whole audio file. So in this case now, I have one, two, three, four, five, and six whole audio files, of which only one is a multi-channel whole audio file. Numbers one, two, three, four, and vocals underscore O1 are mono whole audio files. How many subset clips do I have that are mono? I have one, two, four, and five. So one, two, three, four, four audio subset clips, which are mono. How many multi-channel subset clips do I have? That means I should look for the files which are not bold, but have the arrow in front of them. So one, two, and three. I have three multi-channel audio subset clips, right? Make sure you understand this, right? The difference between a whole file and a subset clip. A subset clip is just information about or information that is uh, the individual start and end points that are contained within a whole audio clip. A whole file, uh, a whole audio clip is basically the file that actually gets created when you do a recording, which means every whole audio file will have a corresponding WAV file or AIFF file in your audio files folder, right? So that's the difference 
between a whole file and a subset clip. Um, how do you delete a clip? How do I delete a subset clip or how do I delete a clip from my track itself? Let's zoom out so that we can see more. If I wanted to delete my audio clip, well, there are a couple of ways in which I can do that. I can just select all of my clips and press the delete key on my keyboard. That will allow me to do that. But here's the thing to remember. If you delete a clip from a track, you are not deleting the clip from the session. If you look at your clips list now, you will still see that overheads underscore 01 is still there. And the subset clips that I created are still there too. Which means if I wanted to bring back overheads 01, all I need to do is come to the clips list and drag and bring it back to this, file, uh, to this track. And I, have my clips, uh, uh, and I have my clip back on my track over here. So I have not deleted the clip from my session. Selecting a clip on a track and pressing the delete key is not taking out the file from the session at all. If you wanted to take out the clip from the session, you have to do that from the clips list, which means if I wanted to delete my vocals underscore O one clip from my, from my entire session, I would have to come here, right click on clips underscore O one, and then select clear if I wanted to delete it. If you don't want to right click, you can even use a pop-up menu in the clips list by after selecting the clips that you want to delete and then say clear. Now, when you do clear, you have a couple of different choices, right? There, there are different ways in which you can clear. You can just take it out from the session if you want. You could take it out from the session and take it out from your audio files folder and put it in your recycle bin or your trash as we call it in the Mac or you could take it out completely without putting it in the trash can at all, which means there is absolutely no way in which you can bring it back. If I do remove from here, Pro Tools will ask me, are you sure you want to do it? I'm going to say yes, and it's gone. It's gone from my track. It's gone from my clips list. It's nowhere in my session. But because I did remove, if I take a look at my audio files folder, I can see that my vocals underscore 01 file is still in my audio files folder. That means I have removed it from my session, but I have not removed it from my computer itself. So if I wanted to actually bring it back, you could just click and drag it into Pro Tools and Pro Tools will bring it back for you. So you still have the file with you. Now let's take a look at what happens if I do the other choices. I'm gonna go with audio one underscore 04. And now instead of just doing remove, I'm going to say move to trash. When I say move to trash, Pro Tools will again ask me, are you sure you want to do it? Yeah, I'm going to say yes. The session, the file is gone from my track. The file is gone from my clips list. And if I take a look at my audio files folder, the file is gone from there as well. But the file is in my recycle bin. So if I wanted to bring it back, I could always copy the file back into my session by just dragging and dropping it into my session itself. Now the third option, let's select audio under, one, un, audio one underscore O3. Again, I'm gonna right click on the name of the clip and I'm gonna say clear. And now I'm going to say delete. And when I do delete, Pro Tools will ask me, are you sure you wanna do it? Permanently delete, yup. And now it's gone from my track. It's gone from my clips list. And if I take a look at my audio files folder, it's gone from there. And if I take a look at my trash can, it's not there either audio one underscore O three cannot be retrieved at all. There's nothing that I can do in order to bring that file back, right? So there are three ways in which you can actually take out the audio clip. You can delete it from the track, but still keep it in the clips list, right? Or you can take it out from the clips list and do remove, which means it'll take it out from the session, but the file is still in your audio files folder. If you say move to trash, it will take it out from the session, from the track, obviously. It will take it out from our audio files folder and it will put it in your trash can or your recycle bin. And the third option is to delete, which means it will take it out from the session, it will take it out from your audio files folder and it will be gone forever. There is nothing that you can do to bring it back. All right? So these are three ways in which you can delete your audio clip. What if I wanted to rename my audio files? What if I wanted to rename the audio recordings after I finished? Like when I did this recording over here my, uh, on my vocals track, it was called Audio 1, Audio 102, 101, 102, 103, 104. 
that was a mess, right? What if you wanted to rename your audio clips? Now, if you're renaming a subset clip, it works a little differently. If you're renaming a whole audio clip, it works a little differently. Since subset clips are not whole audio clips, when I double click on the clip name over here, it will just pop up a window and ask me, do you, what do you want to name it, right? And I want to name this uh, interlude two, right? Does not matter. So when I rename this as interlude two, I can see that it has renamed the clip even in my clips list, right? I have audio 102 over here, which is a whole audio file. How do I know it's a whole audio file? Well, I can see it's in bold in my clips list. And if I look in my audio files folder, I see the file over there as well, right? So if I double click over here, if I double click on a whole audio clip in order to do a rename, I get a couple of choices. Once I give it a name, let's say I call this uh, song one, I can choose to tell Pro Tools to rename the clip only inside Pro Tools. That means this is a name that only Pro Tools will know about that audio clip. Or I can tell Pro Tools to rename the clip inside Pro Tools and on my disk itself. Let's see what happens when I say name clip only and I say, okay, I can see that it has changed the name on my track in my clips list, it's called song one. But if I take a look at my audio files folder, it's still called audio one underscore O two right? It's not called song one. So if I wanted to make sure that it gets renamed in both places, when I double click over here, I'm just going to call this song. And I'm now I'm going to say name clip and disk file. And when I say, okay, it does the same thing inside Pro Tools. I can see that it has changed the name in my clips list. And when I look inside my audio files folder, I will see that now audio one underscore O two has become song.aiff, right? So that's what happens when you rename an audio clip. Very, very important thing is to never rename the audio file by yourself inside the audio files folder. If you change the name of a file from here, when you launch Pro Tools, Pro Tools does not know that you changed the name of the file. So when you launch Pro Tools, Pro Tools will still look for the file with the old name. So whenever you want to rename a file, please make sure that you do that only from inside Pro Tools, right? You can do it from the audio, uh, from the clips list as well. You can just use the, uh, the pop-up menu and you can say rename over here or you can right click on the name of the clip directly over here and select rename as well. It brings up the same options, right? If it's a whole audio clip, you will have the choice of renaming only the clip. That means inside Pro Tools only. That means what Pro Tools calls that file or you can choose to rename the Pro Tools reference, that means the name inside Pro Tools, and have the same name on the outside, which is what you usually want, and that's the reason why that is chosen by default. So if you don't want to change, you can just hit cancel. So this is how you do your file management inside Pro Tools, right? Make sure you always rename or delete your files from inside Pro Tools. Do not rename your files in the audio files folder, Never delete your files manually by yourself in the audio files folder. And another thing to remember is if you want Pro Tools to get an audio file or if you want an audio file to be inside Pro Tools, putting them inside the audio files folder is not going to automatically show up in Pro Tools, right? I'll show you how you can uh, import audio files in a, in a later chapter, but that's not how you do it. Always remember when you're managing your files, when you're renaming your files, when you're deleting your files, do them inside Pro Tools itself. Renaming your files is very, very simple. Be in the grabber tool, that means in the bottom half and double click on the clip directly or right click on the name of the clip itself or you can select the clip in the clips list and go to the clips list pop-up menu and select rename over here. To delete, just use the clear button and remember the three choices for deleting. Be sure, be 100% sure if you are using the delete option. If you're not sure, always do move to trash, right? So that you can copy it and then place it somewhere just in case you ever need to get back to that particular file. All right? So that is the end of chapter five. Uh, what we saw today was how we can use different kinds of hardwares in order to set up Pro Tools for recording a session. 
whether you're using a built-in interface uh, or your built-in sound card and microphone that is, sorry, speakers and microphone that is, or whether you, you choose to use an external interface, you can choose the interface that you want from the playback engine, which is under the setup menu. Uh, you can combine multiple interfaces on a Mac using the aggregate I.O., which is uh, something that can be enabled using the ASIO drivers in Windows as well, All right? Uh, we saw how we can record uh, audio clips. Always make sure when you are doing a recording on a track, your recording levels, your input levels, not output, your input levels are around the minus 10 mark. A little above the minus 10 is always good. Be in the light green to yellow zone. Red is bad, dark green is bad. So light green to yellow zone is, is, the good, uh, is, is a good range to be in. We saw how you can uh, add a click track. We saw how you can customize the click sound. You can change the accented, the unaccented sounds as well. You can change the volume. If you want, you could experiment by changing the meter. So you could have your tempo be at 120 BPM, your meter be at 44 or at a different BPM. And uh, if your session can be at one BPM and meter, your click can be in a different BPM and meter. Feel free to play around with that. It's pretty cool. Um, there is no uh, restriction on having more than one click uh, in your Pro Tools session, which means, as I said, if your drummer wants a different kind of click and your guitarist wants a different kind of click, you can keep both people happy uh, using Pro Tools. It's, it's pretty cool. Um, let's see. Uh, one more thing I wanted to show you is whenever you do any recording, uh, as we said, you know, it's always good to make sure that you have enough hard disk space. We've seen how to calculate hard disk space, so I'm not going to go over that again. But Pro Tools actually has an easier way which will help you understand whether you have enough space or not when you do a recording, right? So if you actually come up to the window menu, you will see the second last option over here that's called disk usage. When you select it, Pro Tools shows you all the hard drives that you have connected to your system at this time, right? Like over here, it says that I have two hard drives connected to my computer. One is called Macintosh HD, the other is called Data HD. Pro Tools tells me the size of the hard disk. It also tells me how much space is available for me. And it also tells me if I record at this sample rate and this bit depth, how many minutes of audio I can actually record. Which means if I'm recording, if I'm going to do my recording on my data HD, which is where my session is, I can record 36,671.1 minutes of audio, right? So it depends on the sample rate and bit depth. So if I was choosing a higher sample rate and higher bit depth, then the number of minutes that I could record would be lesser, right? Obviously, this is saying the number of minutes on one track. So if you have multiple tracks, make sure you divide that number by that many tracks so that you can gauge exactly how, many, how, how much audio you can record on your, uh, in your existing session on your existing drive. And lastly, always, always remember that this fader that we have in our mix window does not control the input level. It only controls the output level of the sound that is being recorded in Pro Tools. All right. That is the end of uh, Chapter 5. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me at any time. I can be reached via email and I'll do my best to help you out. All right. Thank you very much, guys. Take care.